I'm Elise Hugh. You're listening to TED Talks Daily. And today for our summer book club series, a look at the other side of the equation from the writer's point of view. We're playing a 2021 episode of Design Matters that's all about writing. Host Debbie Millman talks with author Jacqueline Woodson about becoming a writer, how she developed the stories we now know and love, like Last Summer with Mazin, and why there needs to be more diversity in publishing. As a child, Jacqueline Woodson loved to tell lies. There was something about seeing her friend's eyes grow wide with wonder that she loved. She got into trouble for lying, but didn't stop until fifth grade. That same year, she wrote a story, and her fifth grade teacher said, this is really good. That was when Jacqueline Woodson understood that a lie on the page was called fiction, and that could win you accolades and awards. Flash forward a few decades and many stories later, and she has indeed won many, many accolades and awards, including a National Book Award, several Newbery honors, and in 2020, she won a MacArthur Genius Award. Jacqueline Woodson, welcome to Design Matters. It's so nice to be here, Debbie. Thank you. Jacqueline, you stated that when you were growing up, it was your sister who was the one that was considered smart, um, Mm -hmm. that you had a hard time reading. You had to read things over and over for the words to make sense. You've talked about this quite eloquently in your TED Talk. Yet you fell in love with reading and writing. Even though it was so difficult, it still was something that you were pulled towards Mhm. Yeah, it was a challenge and I I knew I knew I had it inside me somehow that it was just coming out differently. And I think that if I had been born now, I probably wouldn't be the writer I am because it it meant people having a certain kind of patience, but it also meant me not getting uh, tagged as dyslexic or something which would have put me into programs that would have made me have to find trick ways to read faster or to write faster. And I think doing my my process was the process of becoming a writer, um, taking that time, really deconstructing words and the way authors got stories on the page. So I do think that behind that quote unquote struggle was the makings of me as a writer. And uh, and so I, I don't think I ever felt any shame about it. I always felt, even as a young person, that I was right and the, the system that was in place to say that the way I was doing it wasn't the right way, was wrong, was a broken thing. Right. <laughs> um, and even with my sister who, and my older brother, who were both very academic and, you know, off the charts in the way they learned. I just saw that as their thing, right? They just learned differently. And because of the system that was set up in our house, which was that they had to help me get to where I needed to be, I didn't fail, right? Because if, if I failed, they would have been in trouble. So, of course, it, would, it was a struggle there, too. Now, were you really truly telling lies or were you just making up fantastical stories that people thought were lies? Both, both. I mean, you know, if someone went to Coney Island, I went to Coney Island too, right? And I got on this, right? And that was a lie. I didn't. I wish I had, but I didn't. And, you know, it was just to be a part of the conversation. It was to be a part of the narratives that were being told. I I never told fantastical lies. I mean, one of them was that my father lived in San Luis Obispo. Oh, I don't even know how to pronounce it, but, but I found it on a map and I decided that's where my father lived for years. Like he was right in Ohio, I, but Ohio is not interesting. This place in California, having never been to California that I don't know, seemed more interesting. And so it was the kind of daily lies that also got told, but also, you know, lies about things I've done and trips I was going to take, all of that stuff. Like, I, 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 yeah, they were stories. You said this about your early love affair with writing. I loved and still love watching words flower into sentences and sentences blossom into stories. Yet, Jackie, early on, you still thought you might be a hairdresser or a teacher or a lawyer. When did Mm -hmm. you decide you wanted to be a writer? 
I didn't want to be any of those things. I was just saying that stuff because that's what adults wanted me to be. You had to have a backstory for adults. And I love doing hair. Then everybody else is not my own. My mom had thought I should be a lawyer because I was always arguing. Um, <laughs> and we played school a lot. And I liked being a teacher, you know, and I loved teaching my little brother. I loved what my sister taught me. And also, when you look at it, those were the fields that Black people went into, especially hairdressing and teaching. And so it seemed it's seemed achievable. And for me, you know, in my head, those were the backup plans if writing didn't work out. But I really didn't have a backup plan. Like, And even in thinking about those as careers, um, writing was something I was going to always do. I, I just wrote this forward for Catherine McKinley's book, uh, The African Lookbook, where I talked about, you know, growing up, I was sent to sewing school every Saturday morning, um, singer sewing school, because my mother was a Southerner. And she's like, if all else fails, you can sew. <laughs> like, you can be a seamstress. Yeah, so. my mom was a seamstress. So that's how I learned to sew. Oh, uh, I love sewing. I love it now. But. <laughs> <laughs> you went to college at Adelphi University. You majored in British literature and and Middle English? No, I actually majored in English and minored in British literature. Okay, okay. After you graduated, you worked at a children's packaging company. I worked for a children's book packaging company, yeah, Kirchhoff Wahlberg. And what kind of work were you doing at that time? I started out as a receptionist, and then I was doing some editorial work. I did some writing where I wrote some of the standardized tests that were um in books, you know, I apologize for that. <laughs> that was basically it. I, you know, did office managing and editing and writing and just kind of anything that they asked me to do and any writing they allowed me to do. In the reading comprehension test that you wrote, is that when your character of Maison first appeared? Did you write about uh, her in the... Yes. So I had already written last summer with Mason, uh, the book. And so I used part of that in that reading comprehension. I can't uh, even the, imagine what like that would be like to find that test now. <laughs> I just I had it somewhere. You know, I just sent all my archives to the Beinecke and that was I came across this. I was like, ah, get it out of here. I'm so sorry oh. <laughs> for participating in standardized testing in this way. You enrolled in Bunny Gable's children's book writing class at the New School, where B.B. Willoughby, an editor at Delacorte, heard you reading from what would become your first book. And she requested the manuscript. Delacorte bought it. And in 1990, your first book, Last Summer with Mason, came out. You were 27. How did your family respond to you being a published author? I don't think they understood. You know, I think that if they, my, my mom and my grandma, I think their biggest concern was, am I going to be able to pay my rent? And they didn't understand how the um, publishing industry worked. They didn't understand advances and royalty, you know, advances against royalties and royalties payments. And so I think that they, they were very, very proud. And, and I think their big fear was like, okay, is this going to be enough to keep you living outside of our house, <laughs> or are you going to have to move back in? But I think they were concerned. I mean, I was queer. I was an artist. I was like, there wasn't the husband rescue coming, right? There, there wasn't the job with pension rescue coming. So how was I going to be able to be okay? Um, so they were concerned. Very few of your books are autobiographical, but you did draw on some of your own history in writing the Mason trilogy. How did your family feel about seeing some of their personalities in your books? It's so funny because even when I talked about being a writer, like their big fear was like, don't go spread in our dirty laundry. right? <laughs> and I always thought, you know, the characters in my head are so much more interesting than what's happening in my real life. Um, I think that in Last Summer with Mason, they didn't see themselves so much. I don't think my grandmother read it. Um, I think the first book my grandmother read of mine through and through was um, We Had a Picnic This Sunday Past, which was a picture book. And and I think uh, she she would always say, your books are too sad for me. Um, but but I, it would be like I could write a short story with a white grandmother and my grandmother's like, oh, there you go. Put me in one of your books again and one of your stories again if I talk to her about it. But I think that 
they really didn't see themselves. I remember my mother asking me at one point, like, when am I going to be a character in one of your books? And, you know, of course, it wasn't until Brown Girl Dreaming after she passed away that I was able to truly tell her story. But but I really tried to shy away from too much autobiographical writing just because I didn't want people coming for me. <laughs> Last Summer with Mason came out in 1990, as I mentioned. The Dear One followed in 1991. Since then, you've written over 30 books. These include picture books, books for young adults, books for adults, and poetry. You've won pretty much every award a writer can win, including a National Book Award, several Coretta Scott King Awards, Newbery Awards, and in 2020, as I mentioned in the introduction, you won a MacArthur Genius Award. At one point after Last Summer with Mason, were you able to stop working side jobs and write full time? So in 1991, I went to McDowell for the first time. That was the first artist residency that accepted me. I had been applying and that kind of changed my life. And at that point, I went I was working part time to. No, I'm sorry. In 1990, I went to McDowell. And then in 1991, I got a fellowship at the Fine Arts Work Center, which is a seven month fellowship. You move to Provincetown um, from October through May. And basically, they give you a stipend and a place to live. And that was the point where I said, OK, I'm going to take this leap. And I stayed in Provincetown for five years because it was so much cheaper to live there. And I worked part-time. I started teaching and and writing for one of the local magazines to help make ends meet. You're usually working on more than one book at a time. How do you develop the story ideas? When do you know that this is something I want to pursue for a book? Pretty early on. Like I have the idea for the story and I have the character's voice. I I think a lot of my books are character driven. I don't know what the character wants always or how they're going to get it in the narrative, but I do have a sense of place and some of the stuff I'm trying to talk about or work out for myself, because I always think all the books I'm writing, I'm trying to work out something for myself pretty early on. And of course, it falls apart. Of course, it becomes something completely different than what I thought it was going to become. Uh, of course, it's a puzzle, like when you look at something like Red at the Bone, where I'm trying to figure out so many things. Um, but early on, I have the characters and a little bit more than that. Do you write a book from beginning to end or do you write your plots out of order and then piece them together? Or do you just sort of sit down and let the work surprise you? (laughs) I let it surprise me. I never pull, I never know what a plot is. I just think you put two people in the room and get them talking. You have conflict, you have plot, you have it all. I do try to go from beginning to end for the first draft. And um, sometimes I'll get to the middle and go right the end and then come back and write toward, especially when it's falling apart and I'm not sure what I'm trying to say. And then writing that last line helps me understand where I'm going. When you say falling apart, what do you mean? <laughs> it means it sucks. <laughs> like like something you wrote yesterday that sounded so amazing. You wake up the next morning and you read it and you're like, this, this, is, this is trash. And you think you have an idea that's a strong one for where you want the book to be carried to. And it's not. It's, it's just superficial and dumb. And, you know, you're using tropes and cliches, which is the biggest fear for me is like, I'll pick up a book and read a cliche in it that I've written. <laughs> so so it's a lot of rewriting, a lot of reading out loud. When I get off this podcast, I'm working on a book now that I'm going to, I need to just sit and read out loud and, and figure out what's happening and what I need to fix. You've said this about the stories you want to tell. I wanted to write about communities that were familiar to me and people that were familiar to me. I wanted to write about communities of color. I wanted to write about girls. I wanted to write about friendship and all of these things that I felt were missing in a lot of the books that I read as a child. And and Jacqueline, you have. And I was researching the level of diversity in children's books now and found a statistic from 2018. I couldn't find anything much more formal about 2021. But I learned that diversity in children's books as recently as 2018 looked like this. 50% were about white children. 27% were about animals or fantasy characters. 10% were about African-American children. 7% were about Asian children. 5% were about Latinx children. 
and 1% were about American Indian children. Mm -hmm. So from what I understand, things have only improved marginally since then, three years ago. And I don't expect that you should be able to solve a problem you had (laughs) no hand in creating and are almost single-handedly trying to change. But given this problem is clearly established, what do you think it's going to take for publishing to make material changes in regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion? Publishing houses have to change. I mean, you know, I I think about someone like Debbie Reese, who has the blog American Indians and Children's Book, who's, you know, like trying to single handedly change the narrative of the scarcity of books for and about and by indigenous people. You look at the Latinx numbers and there are a lot of Latinx writers. Why are those books not getting the shine or publishing? And then you go to the publishing houses and they're white. You know, they are so white and, but publishing houses need to change and and there's a reticence. I, I think people are not wanting to give up the power they have as publishers, as editors, as publicists. And I I remember writing in Locomotion, you know, about white blindness, people not being able to see the whiteness around them, you know, from the point of view of this 11-year-old boy, because I think kids see this, right? Um, but but I do think that's what the change that's where the change has to come. I mean, at this point, you know, I'm Jacqueline Woodson, so I'm a safe person to publish. And and what about the Jacqueline Woodsons of 1989, who no one was looking at? Um, so so I do think we have so much work to do. Um, the the work, the publishing houses, the need for people to really not only understand how important these books are, but that they can sell if we put the energy behind them. Because I think that's the other argument that, well, people aren't buying those books. I remember they said that until Terry McMillan published, right? I remember having an argument with an editor at um, Outright, which was a writer's conference back in the day, about Black folks not buying books. And that's why publishers don't publish them. And I was blown away. I mean, so I do think there is so much that can still be done because I I walk into these classrooms and, you know, there are a couple of my books on the shelf and I am the Black representation, even though I know that there are so many other authors out there doing the work. And when we look at Asian numbers, when we look at Latinx numbers, when we look at the numbers of Indigenous people, those shelves are, you know, struggling, to say the least. I discovered We Need Diverse Books, mm-hmm. which lives at diversebooks.org. And and I think that it's a, a really interesting place for people to go for resources if they're looking for specific books. Yeah, We Need Diverse Books is an amazing organization and, and really doing the work to increase um, visibility and uh, and get those books published. You know, Kwame Alexander has an imprint. Chris Myers has an imprint. A number of people have imprints where they're publishing books about, by and for and about people of color. I mean, they're for everyone and they're by and about, um, which is another important thing because that was one of the things publishers were doing. They were publishing books supposedly, quote unquote, for a certain group of people, but they were not necessarily written by those people. (laughs) Well, I actually, uh, that segues perfectly into the next question Mm -hmm. that I want to ask you. I've been thinking about your comments about disliking books that don't offer some type of hope And you've pointed to the book Sounder as an example of a bleak and hopeless novel. And that book traumatized me when I read it in junior (laughs) high school. And in prep for this interview, I read the Wikipedia entry yesterday to sort of re-familiarize myself with the plot. I actually started weeping while I read the Wikipedia entry. And it is a really heartbreaking, hopeless story. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that Sounder was written by a white man. Exactly. Exactly. That's why I hate it. You know, it's a it's a white perspective on a black family. And and at the beginning of the book, he says he some an old black man told him this story or something like that. It, it, it's so broken in so many ways. I mean, you know, all all hats off to Cicely Tyson and the crew that killed the movie, right. which is very different from the book. But that book was constantly being put into the hands of young people. It won the Newbery. It would never win the Newbery today. And and it was a hopeless story of, you know, it, from the white gaze of, of black existence. If a black person had told that story, it would be completely different. I actually, in thinking about the book, 
in the last 24 hours realized that the only being, because I can't even say person, the only mm-hmm. being in the book that had a name it's was the Sounder, the dog. Yeah. Nobody nope. else had a name. Mm-mm. And they never hug each other, which is not the Southern way. <laughs> you know, there's so much, but but that's the first. And as a kid, I remember that was the first day I was like, what are their names? Especially as a writer and, and especially as a young person who wanted to write and realizing that it was written by a white guy. It's like, what message are kids of color taking away from that in terms of how who they can be as writers? And I think that's the, that's what we've been trying to talk about for so long. This is what Dr. Rudin Sims Bishop talks about. This is, you know, what we need to first books is fighting for is like, what message are we giving our young people when we don't have the books that represent them, when we have books that are not written by the people who look like they do? You write about social, economic, physical, sexual, and racial issues, and mostly your characters learn about themselves and grow a new awareness about themselves in your books. But you're writing, it's never cheesy or preachy or heavy handed. How do you balance the sort of innate optimism and hopefulness in your books with such hard topics? It's funny because I think a lot of people wouldn't think the topics are hard. They're just our everyday lives. So for them, they have to be able to find the hope to get up every morning inside of that reality. And so for me as a writer, that's where I go to. It's like, um, it was Madeline Lingle who said, when you write, write remembering the child you were because the essence of childhood doesn't change. And so I go back to who I was at a certain age and remember this stuff that was glorious, right? And and that's not to hit people over the head because that's also the first rule of writing for young people is you can't be didactic. But go back to where the light was, to where the sun was, and what was the reason that we did continue to walk through the world. Um, you know, also, I remember reading all those books about queer kids and they always either committed suicide or tried to commit suicide, right? Like that was the ending if you were a queer kid in the 70s and even in the early 80s. And for me, like that, that that's not an option, right? And, and I don't think that should be an option for anyone. And so when I'm writing about these topics that are real life, what I really try to go to is, is the nuance of all that that means. It is the hope, it is the struggle, it is the reward um, and the growth. And, and that's what comes to the book. My three favorite books of yours are your first, of course, Last Summer with Mason. I love that book. Um, the children's book, The Great Sophie Blackall Illustrated, Pecan Pie Baby, and your memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming. And one thing I loved about Pecan Pie Baby was the emotion that you write for Gia, the little girl who was anticipating her mom's new baby. And you write this from Gia's perspective. Some days I just sat on my stoop thinking about all the years it has been just me and mama, about us drinking hot chocolate and telling silly stories, about the mornings I jumped into her bed when it was still blue pink outside, snuggling up to her while she tried to keep on sleeping. In three short sentences, you know so much about how Gia feels. How do you do that? (laughs) How do you do that? It. It's so unlock it for us. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thanks for reading that, too. Uh, You know, that book has such a special place in my heart. Our kids are six years apart. And and I always think about, you know, when you make that decision to bring a second child into the world, what you gain and what you lose and what the child gains and what the child loses. And and it is about, you know, reading out loud to get to the essence of what the moment is. It doesn't mean a whole lot of adjectives. It's just like, take me into the moment and then take me out again. And and trust that the moment on its own without a lot of extra words around it makes sense. And by the time I wrote Pecan Pie Baby, I was already a mom. And I had gone through hundreds of picture books with a whole lot of words in them. And I was I was not going to do that to another parent. <laughs> like, like, you know, the kid would come to bed and, and there would be a book and it's like, this is like the Bible. No, we're not reading this tonight. You know, go get me Mo Willems. Go get me someone who has about four words in the book and I'm good. <laughs> but yeah, it really was. I really, in that book, wanted to get to the essence and, and also really represent what it means to be family and 
And then I found out that you don't even like pecan pie. <laughs> I don't. I just eat sweet. I really don't. <laughs> You've said that Brown Girl Dreaming is the story of yourself and an ode to those who came before you, who made a way out of no way so that you could be educated and truly live the American dream. It is a stunningly beautiful book. It won a National Book Award, a Coretta Scott King Award, an NAACP Award, and a Newbery Honor. You wrote the book in verse. What made you decide to do that? Because it's a story, it's memory. And I think it would be completely dishonest to try to write a memoir as chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. I mean, that's not how memory works. That's not how it comes to us. It comes to us as these small moments with all of this white space, all of this unknown around it. And so um, I wanted to represent that on the page. And, and so it made sense to write it in verse. You said that one of the reasons you wrote Brown Girl Dreaming was to understand who your mom was before she um, was your mother. And you wanted Mm -hmm. to understand exactly how you got here and the context of your life through their stories. How often were you surprised as you were researching your life and talking to your relatives and friends? Every single day. I remember, you know, my best friend is uh, Toshi Regan and she's a musician. She came up through the civil rights movement. You know, her mom was part of SNCC. And I remember whenever I'm writing and stuck, I sit down and I talk to her. And I remember when I was writing it and it was all over the place and it just it just felt boring and didn't make sense. And I was whining about no one's ever going to read this because it's so specific to me and it, it just nothing's happening. And nothing was happening when I was a kid. And she said, what are you talking about? This country was on fire in 1963. Like everything was happening. And that first um, poem, I am born as the South explode, too many people, too many years, enslaved and emancipated, but not free, keep marching and fighting and getting killed so that young people like me can grow up free. You know, it just fell into place. And the rest of the book began to make sense. And everything from, you know, where my mother was during the civil rights movement to the fact that, um, you know, my great great grandfather was part of the um, civil war, like just surprise after surprise. And with each one, I kept saying, we were here. We were here because I think the thing about our histories and our ancestors, it feels theoretical, right? It feels almost like something that's so not tangible because it's just a story. Um, But the more you investigate the stories, the more I did, the more I realized that I am so part of a long line, that I didn't just wake up this morning, Jacqueline Woodson, that is because of my mother, my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather. So there were so many surprises. As I was reading Brown Girl Dreaming, I was struck by the way you wrote about air. The word first shows up in this sentence about your father catching a football. Coaches were watching the way he moved, his easy stride, his long arms reaching up, snatching the ball from its soft pocket of air. That sentence astounded me. You then go on to talk about air throughout the book. You write about how there is too much air between words and the lilt of her words, a breath of warm air moving over each leaf, and this about your grandfather's illness. His cough moves through the air back into our room where the light is almost blue, the white winter sun painting it. And Jacqueline, as I researched this, I found that there are academic papers analyzing your use of air and dirt (laughs) in Brown Girl Dreaming. (laughs) I didn't even know if you know this. No way. I had no idea. (laughs) Yes. Because I was like, I wonder if there's anybody that's written about this that I could ask her about it. And I found that there are, there's a, there's an academic paper about your use of air and dirt. Um, And I'm wondering about how conscious you were of at least the theme of air as you were writing. That's wild. I had no idea that people are doing that kind of research on me. Uh, I think the air thing for me comes with the juxtaposition between the country and the city. And having um, made that transition as a young person, and when I think of the past, when I think of the South, when I think of Ohio, when I think of so much that has come before me, I do think there's much more air in that. Um, You know, I think of this moment and the city as being much more confining. 
So even in writing that scene, Football Dreams, when、um, I'm talking about my dad, like I see that moment as. As this very outdoor moment, you know, lots of lots of white space, lots of, you know, sky, lots of field, and a lot of times when I look back on Greenville, that's how I remember it.、Um, when I look back on the past and and the places that I can't touch or see anymore, I remember them as being much more open than the present spaces that are much more confined. Um, Jacqueline, I just have a few last questions for you today. The first is about your MacArthur Fellowship. Last <laughs> year, you won one of the most prestigious honors in the world, the MacArthur Genius Award. And I read that you're planning to use the grant money to expand the residency program you founded for people of color. Can you talk a bit more about the program, how you chose the name, and your goals for it? Yeah, it's great. It's been great. We actually have a fellow here now.、Um, it's called Baldwin for the Arts, named after James Baldwin, and modeled a lot after McDowell, which was, as I said earlier, was my first residency,、um, but gave me a lot of support in. Helping me figure not financial support, but figuring out the design for Baldwin. So when we bought this property, we were looking for a space that was big enough. It's four acres, so the and it has four buildings on it that we are renovating into studios for visual artists,、um, composers, and writers that are BIPOC. So it's all it's for BIPOC people. And I really wanted a safe space. I really wanted a place where people could come and not have to. Explain anything. I think as a fellow, even though the fellowships were phenomenal, I was often one of few people of color there, and I really wanted to create a space also modeled after Cave Canem, which I feel like changed the narrative of poetry、um, in terms of thinking about Black poets and and getting their work out into the world. I. Wanted to leave something like that behind. So it, it has been a lot of work, and it's great. <laughs> Jacqueline Woodson, thank you for creating such beautiful work in the world, and thank you so much for joining me today on Design Matters. Oh, thanks for your great questions. It's so nice to talk to you. Thank you. Jacqueline Woodson's most recent books include the New York Times best-selling novel *Red at the Bone* and *Before the Ever After*. You can find out more about all of Jacqueline Woodson's books on her website, jacquelinewoodson.com. This is the seventeenth year we've been podcasting Design Matters, and I'd like to thank you for listening. And remember, we can talk about making a difference, we can make a difference, or we can do both. I'm Debbie Melman. I look forward to talking with you again soon. Design Matters is produced for the TED Audio Collective by Curtis Fox Productions. In non-pandemic times, the show is recorded at the School of Visual Arts Masters and Branding Program in New York City, the first and longest-running branding program in the world. The editor in chief of Design Matters Media is Zachary Pettit, and the art director is Emily Weiland.